we are just one week before Good Friday, so I can understand the somber feeling and the, 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 the mellow feeling. Every year we go through the motions. First must come Good Friday, followed by Resurrection Sunday. It's, it's just symbolic to remind us that Jesus is not dead, but He's alive. So can we just prove to God that He is alive because Jesus is in us? Greetings in Jesus' name. A louder amen. Maybe it will, will just encourage me to know that I'm talking to people. Greetings in Jesus' name. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Now we are getting somewhere. You know, Saturday at 5 is not my regular hour to be preaching in church. I'm a Sunday man. You know, for all of us, we have been so used for the last umpteen years, decades even. We come on Sunday because Sunday is the day that we call the day of the Lord. So coming on a Saturday like this, uh, it takes a bit of adjustment. But uh, you all are here on Saturday, so it's quite a number of people that come on Saturday. May I just remind you that you all are true blood Jews. Yes, if you don't know already, Saturday is the Sabbath for the Jews. We follow the Roman calendar. We are Romans. You are Jews. So maybe you can give yourself a pat at the back. Amen. Praise the Lord. They celebrate Sabbath on Saturday. Amen. And we do it on Sunday. But whichever day it is, we come and worship God in spirit and in truth. So this evening, I have a message. It's not about Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday is tomorrow. I have a message that I would like to share with all of you. And uh, it's a very uncommon message, very rarely, hardly heard of message. But we need to hear sometimes what God has to say. And this message has been born out, out of that three weeks ago when we were in Sarawak, in a sense, because there is a very serious message that God wants to speak to the church in these days that we are in. And I find that there is an urgency for all of us to know what is truly happening in the church of Jesus Christ. So if you have your Bibles, if you don't, it's okay. It will be up on the, uh, on the wall. It's found in the book of uh, 2 Chronicles, chapter 25. Yeah, it says that, Amaziah, the king who reigns in Judah. In verse 1, it says, Amaziah was 25 years old when he became king. And he reigned in Jerusalem 29 years his mother's name was Jehoadan of Jerusalem. And verse 2, it says, this is the important verse, huh? the key verse for today. Verse 2, it says, He did what was right in the sight of the Lord. But there is a, a B-U-T there, a but. It always ends, it has to be a but. When you see a but, that means there is something that we need to take note of. But not with a loyal heart. Let us all pray. Father, we come in Jesus' name tonight. We come, Lord, not with man's wisdom, but we come with the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. And we ask, Lord, that every one of us be given the ears to hear what the Spirit of God is saying, Lord. And Lord, we ask that you anoint our ears and our minds, that our hearts will be open to receive, Lord, all that you have. And that, Lord, the things that you would say and you want your church to do, O oh Lord. So, Father, we just commit this time to your loving hands, we ask, Lord, that you will come in our midst and your presence will dwell in our midst today and that you will touch us in a very special way. We ask, Lord, for that presence and that love. In Jesus' name we ask and pray. Amen. Amaziah was a king because his father was murdered by his servants. His father, Joash, did right 
like what Amaziah did. But somewhere along the way, he faltered. And as a result, he paid a price for that mistake and his servants murdered his father. So now Amaziah takes over the seat of the throne of Judah. And during this time in the history of Israel, Israel is divided into two kingdoms. The northern part is known as Israel and the southern part is known as Judah. And so this guy, he's now the king over the southern part, which is Judah. And he sits on the throne when he's 25 years old and he ruled and reigned for 29 years. And the Bible says, he did what was right in the eyes of God, but not with a loyal heart. Now, what does it mean by a loyal heart? In the Hebrew context, the word loyal in our, some of our Bibles is written as a complete heart, with a whole heart, with a perfect heart. It, it was something that he didn't have, he lacked that. And in the second slide, maybe we can show the second slide. In the Hebrew context, it's called shalem, a complete or perfect. So his heart was not complete. It was not perfect. He was one of those Christians in our modern day that we will call nominal Christians. We will be the ones that will come to church religiously, either on a Sunday or a Saturday. We will be some of those who will come and just worship and sing praises. We will be some of those that will just do whatever that needs to be done in the house of God. We will be one of those that will listen and maybe obey. But Amaziah was that type of Christian. One of those that did right in the eyes of God. And as you read, as you will read this entire chapter, you will understand why it was written that he did not have a perfect or a loyal heart. You see, in the first place, after he took over the reins from his father, the first thing that he did, he did right in the eyes of God, in the law of Moses, whereby the servants that murdered his father, he had them put to death. But he spared the family and the children of those two servants. So he did right. He followed the laws of Moses. But then again, if you read, continue to read this story, this man, he lived his life for God like a roller coaster. One day he was up, the next it was down. The next it was up, and then it was down. He had a life that was compromising. And in his reign, he had prepared an army of 300,000 soldiers to go to war with the Edomites. The Edomites were actually his forefathers' relation. You know Jacob? Jacob had a brother called Esau. These are the descendants of Esau, the Edomites. And now this man, Amaziah, was preparing an army to go to war with the Edomites. So he raised up an army of 300,000 and he looked at the army and he says, I may not have enough men to win this battle. Now I must secure and recruit another 100,000 more from Israel. So when you recruit the army from another country, he obviously had to pay them wages. And he was prepared to pay them in terms of silver to the tune of three and three quarter tons of silver. He had to pay them. But just before he embarked on this battle with the Edomites, a prophet came to Amaziah and told him, Amaziah, you don't need these 100,000 people. You only need God to be on your side. Send these 100,000 back. God will give you the victory. So when he heard this, he was very troubled because he had already promised them the wages so that three and three quarter tons of silver was just going to be blown into the wind. But he knew that God would somehow pay back what he had lost. So he decided to send these 100,000 soldiers back to their homeland in Ephra, Ephraim. And these soldiers were not happy, even though they got paid, because they never got to fight. But they went back anyway, and he obeyed God, and 
Amaziah took the 300,000 soldiers of his, went to war with the Edomites, and he won the battle. He won the battle. And as you read the Bible, thousands were killed in that battle. Thousands. You know, when they fight in those days, they go by big numbers. Huh? Not small numbers, but by big numbers. So after that, he captured a lot of prisoners. All these prisoners that he captured, he took them up to a hill and he pushed them down from the hill and killed all of them, 10,000 of them. My goodness. He followed the laws of God. But when he had those enemies captured as captives, he murdered them. Just pushed them down the hill. Let them crash into the rocks. And then he took the spoils from all of them. Their gold, their silver, and all their articles of worship, their little idols, calf images. He brought them. He brought them home with, with him to Judah. So that is why the Bible says, he did right in the eyes of God, but his heart was not loyal. He was what we would call in today's terms, a nominal Christian. A one that will be down one day and up the other and down one day. A compromising Christian. He worshipped the gods of his enemies. He bowed down his knees to the God of the enemies. And he did all kinds of things in the eyes of God. God was not pleased with it. God sent another prophet to speak to Amaziah. And to tell him where he was wrong. And this time, when this prophet came and told Amaziah what was happening in his life, what was he doing wrong, Amaziah got fed up and said, get out of my sight. I'm not going to listen to you. So, this man, this king, had just signed his death warrant. By rejecting God's prophet and God's word, he just signed his death warrant. Of course, he lived to a good old age. He fought many other battles. One significant battle that he fought with Israel. He lost that battle because God had already left him. The presence of God had already left him. God has lifted up his protection and his cover over this man's life because of what he did and what he was doing. And so there was no more presence of God. You know, the danger for us in the church today is that we sometimes think that God is here, but actually God had, or God had already left. And that's the danger. I've gone to many churches. Now, I'm not saying this as a fear, but I'm telling you this as a truth. Sometimes the things that we do in church doesn't please God at all. And the way he does it is that he just walks out. He says, I'm not in this place. I'm not partaking of this. And he walks out. But the sad thing is, the people do not realize it. Just like in Amaziah's life. He didn't realize that God had already walked out on him. He went to battle with Israel thinking that God would still give him the victory. But actually, God was never on his side. And he lost that battle. And as a result, he was put to captive. After he came back, the same thing that happened to his father happened to this man. There were two assassins. They were out to kill him. And he knew about it. He ran out from Jerusalem to a town called Lachish, which is about 23 kilometers from Jerusalem. He thought he would hide there. See, the moment the presence of God leaves you, there's nowhere we can hide from the enemy. They will smell us out, they will find us out. And so, 
There was nowhere that Amaziah could hide except be killed. His sign is death warrant many, many months before that. So we see the life, a very simple life of a king who took over the throne when he was 25, reigned for 29 years, and he lived his life as a nominal Christian, a Christian by name. Someone in our modern day context that will come and will just go through the rituals, go through the motions, but not really having a relationship with God. God is more concerned with our walk with Him than our work for Him. This is, this is a fact. God is concerned about our relationship. And I would highlight this story today because as a check and balance so that when we go through life as a Christian, that there will always be this check and balance to know that our heart is right with God. It must be, it has to be, because otherwise we may run foul of being called a nominal Christian. So we must be on fire for God because Jesus said, you are either hot or you are either cold, but not lukewarm, please. Lukewarm, God says, I'll spew out my mouth. So we need to be at maximum on either side. We need to have a right relationship with God. And this evening, I believe in GT, we are going on that track and we need to ask ourselves, are we on fire for God? Are we having a right relationship with God? And I can tell you this evening, this is not an easy message to preach. But it has to be said. Otherwise, we may not even realize that the presence of God has left us. Three weeks ago when I was in Sarawak, I shared with a Baptist church amongst the leaders, the pastors, the leaders in the Baptist church. And I walked through with them on the history of Sarawak. Sarawak is a very special state where God is concerned. In 1935, God sent missionaries to Sarawak, right into the heartland of Sarawak, in the hills of Barrio, among a group of people, ethnic group of people, that you have hardly heard and hardly met, and I don't believe you have seen, this group of people known as the Kalabits. God reached out to this group high up, hidden in the hills of Sarawak in 1935, and the Spirit of God came upon those villagers and those people there. And a revival started in 1935. And news spread over many villagers. And entire village, village by village, received the Lord. They all became Christians. But by the time came in 1963, most of these villagers, most of these people there, they had children, they had grandchildren, they all grown up. They were still Christians, but what happened was they only knew God because of what their forefathers told them. They only knew God because their, their fathers were Christian. So they have come to a place where they were going through the motions and it has become such that they were actually nominal Christians. Nominalism is one of the greatest enemy of the church. So in 1963, when this happened, missionaries came back into these villages and they discovered that there was a serious need for a revival. They started to engage with these people. They started to reach out to them, preach to them, teach them. This will be the third generation now. And it took many years. Then in 1973, something happened in those hilllands. In a school, in the afternoon, a group of Christian students were just singing and worshipping God that afternoon. And the Spirit of God just came down. It, it was a sudden thing. You know, with God, it's always a sudden thing. Isn't it? 
If you read the book of Acts, it always is a sudden thing. These students started to sing and the Spirit of God just came down. They started to weep. They started to cry. They started to repent. They started to pray for one another. They started to ask for forgiveness with one another. They started to go through and a cleansing period. And the whole afternoon, they were just in that classroom, crying, kneeling down, hugging one another and just repenting before God. They went home, each one to their own homes. They told their parents what happened and their parents started to cry. Their parents started to repent. They went to their families, to their relatives and slowly, one by one, village by village, the fire spread. And then in 1975, this spread to the neighbouring villages in the hilllands of Barrio. To another group of people, ethnic group, called the Lunbawangs. You never heard of them. You probably never seen them. But let me tell you, they are Malaysians. Okay? We Malaysians here are very famous for saying, China, India, Malayu, Dan, line, line. That's why we have a bank called CIMB. China, India, Malayu. B. B is not Dan Lai Lai. B means Bumi Putra. Please cancel out Dan Lai Lai. They are all Malaysians. They are the actual prince of the earth. They are the natural people. So CIMB has got it wrong there, the last character. So it spread to this group called Lumbawangs, and the fire of God moved. In 1975, another wave of revival came. 1978, another wave of revival came over those lands. And there were signs and wonders. Then came 1984. A major revival broke up in the hills. Signs and wonders in the sky. Balls of fire were seen. People were prophesying. The, 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 the ladies and the men who never knew how to read English. They were, they were not taught to read English. They were prophesying from the book of Isaiah. King James Version. If you ask me if that's revival, I say that's revival. Church, this didn't happen in Azusa Street. It didn't happen in North Korea or South Korea. It didn't happen in India or Australia. It didn't happen in... Any parts of the world, it happened here in Malaysia. Four times, God came in a revival. It happened here in our own nation, Malaysia, in Sarawak. Maybe you have not heard about it. Maybe you have forgotten about it. But let me remind you, as I said earlier, God has a special heart for Sarawak. We went to the heartlands three weeks ago. Heartlands of Sarawak to the Iban people. And this was the message that God brought to the people. If God can come one time, two times, three times, four times, there will be the possibility that He will come five times. You don't believe me. You don't look like you believe me. Hey, if you are in Sarawak at that time, you will jump up to the higher seat. All the pastors were excited. Because why? Revival come. Now, you may ask, Pastor, why are you so interested in Sarawak? Uh, am I promoting tourism in Sarawak? I say, no, sir. I'm not just interested in Sarawak. I'm interested in the fire of God. Amen. Are you interested in the fire of God? I'm interested in the fire that will come down. I'm interested because I told the pastor, the moment this thing happened, please contact me because I'll buy the first ticket out from here to Sarawak. All I want to do is catch the fire. You don't sound excited. Do you want the fire? That's what we need, church. That's what we've been praying for. It's right here in our own doorstep, the very soil that we are standing on, Malaysia. I want that fire. Because in 1984, sadly, that fire in the highlands never reached down to the lowlands of Sarawak. It never went further than Kuching. It never went further than Cebu. It never went further than Miri. It never came across the South China Sea to Peninsular Malaysia. That's the sad news. But this time, we won't make that mistake again. Can you say an amen, GTNs? This time, we need to go there. 
catch the fire and bring it back. And the pastors were excited. Because why? They know in their heart of hearts that one more time, God is going to visit them. You know? You heard the story of Samson? The hero Samson? He was so strong, so anointed. And because of Delilah, you know, Tom Jones sang the song, Why, Why, Why Delilah? It has to be Delilah. He lost his anointing, but somehow the hair grew back, and again, he had his strength back, and he asked God for what? One more time. That strength and that anointing to come back, so that he can destroy all the Philistines in that temple where they worship their gods. Between two pillars, his hands were stretched out so that he can bring down the entire temple and destroy them. He asked God for one more time. And now we're asking God for one more time so that God will bring that revival. And this time, we want to bring it back to West Malaysia. I'm going to show you some of the slides of what happened in Sarawak. We had a team of seven, including myself, going there. And the only thing that I knew about what we would expect in Sarawak was, I said, please expect the unexpected. That's all. With God, you cannot put God in a box. Please expect the unexpected. Now you see the first slide. That is the unexpected. We always see four-wheel drives in our country here in KL. Four-wheel drives, aircon, very clean, very nice. Because all our four-wheel drives, I don't know why we drive four-wheel drives on nice highways and tart roads. Four-wheel drives were designed to drive in logging trails and, and jungle trails. But our four-wheel drives here are fantastic. They are so clean. They don't look like four-wheel drives. Aircon and everything. That is the, that is the four-wheel drive that we set on to go into the jungles, not really jungle, I would say a uh, logging trail to one of the longhouses in Sarawak. I hope this won't discourage you sitting at the back of a four-wheel drive. Bumpy ride, going down steep slopes, 45 degrees incline, down and up like a roller coaster, but it's okay. Sliding left and right in the mud, very exciting, very challenging. I'm only showing you this on Saturday because you guys are young people. Amen. On Sunday, I won't show you this slide. Because we are all aging to perfection. Only Saturday on 5, exclusive. I know you guys can take this. This is nice. Seven people went into Sarawak to visit the longhouses to preach and to share in a Baptist church. Wow, Baptist church. Ah. It's okay. Whether it's Baptist or Assemblies of God or Lutheran or Anglican or even Roman Catholic, it's okay. We need to remove that, that thought, ah, that mental blockage that we are always a church, that church feeling. We need to remove that and think big. We need to think kingdom, church. We need to think, think kingdom because the kingdom of God has come. Amen. So it doesn't matter which church because in the Baptist church, they also speak in tongues. Right? They pray. They worship God. We are all one big family in the church of Jesus Christ. And we move with the Baptist people, the pastors and everybody. And I want to share with you today, the power of God came in such a way that we never expected. The anointing of God swept through all the places that we went. It was unexpected. Cannot be explained. We went thinking just to do our little bit and come home. But God had other plans. And if it needs you to be there to really experience how God is moving in those places. Look at the church. Look at the people. Look at the hunger. Look at their desire for the presence of God. If you see some of these faces, 
these faces that are right up front there, these are quite familiar faces to you. Some may not be familiar to you. Some may be familiar. But let me tell you, all those right up front are from GT. Amen? You have never thought that they will be doing those things here. But then, God had other plans. God used them over there. When they step out there, they are reverends and they are pastors, they are prophets, apostles, whatever you may call them. But they are just people of God, serving God. So the six people that came with me saw the power of God move, not just in the lives of the people there, they saw the power of God move in our own lives. The church in Sarawak is coming out of nominalism. The church of Jesus Christ in Sarawak is moving in the fire of God. In the interiors, pastors are now on fire to move into the longhouses to bring the truth, to set the captives free. For too many years, they've been under the bondage, they've been under deception, they've been under the lie of the enemy. Now these pastors are going back into the longhouses. There are over more than 3,000 longhouses in Sarawak. A typical long house can be 100 meters long. That's how, how huge a long house is. Housing about maybe 40, 50 families. And right now, the only people that have access, free access to these long houses are the pastors. Because they have been given the due honour and respect by the head of the long houses to be able to enter and freely preach the gospel. So, it will not be us that's going to do it. It will be them. We can't go in there. We can go in as visitors, drink some tea, eat some kueh. But to actually be able to minister, it will be those pastors. So our job is to equip. GT, our job is to equip these pastors. And to be equipped, we need to be equipped ourselves. And that is why we have pastors here. That's why we need to have a, an equipping class. We need to be equipped into how to do things. And that is the job of the pastors here. The blueprint for this church, basically, cannot, the blueprint is very simple, actually. We don't need to crack our heads over that. Paul says in the book of Ephesians, for some are given to be apostles, some are given to be prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. Only some are given to be apostles, some are given to be prophets, some, only those who are chosen and called to be in that office. Their job and duty is to equip all of us. You are all the saints here to be equipped. And who is going to do the work of the ministry? Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11. The pastors, the evangelists, the prophets, the apostles, their duty and job is to equip us. Once they equip us, we are to do the work of the ministry. So like Paul says in the book of Romans, Brethren, I beseech you. God is making an appeal. Brethren, I beseech you by the tender mercies of God, tender mercies of God, that you will present your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable. This is your reasonable service. Only reasonable. God is asking us for a reasonable service, not an exceptional service, a reasonable service. But you say, Pastor, you are different. I have to work, you know. I have a career. I have a family. Uh, 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 correction. I also have to work. I don't work in the church. I work just like you. I start work at 9 o'clock every Monday morning to every Friday. I finish work at 7 or 8 p.m. every day. Ask my wife. She's witness to that. She says, no need to work so hard. Come home. Every day without fear. Because in her mind, work stops at 5 p.m. But these days, anyone stops work at 5 p.m.? Nobody stops work at 5. So I also work. 
But you say, hey, Pastor, I got problems. Oh, I also got problems. Huh? I've been having problems for the last 30 years. Problems that you have never known. But the fact is, we still present our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable. This is our reasonable service. Well, you don't, Pastor, wait, let me settle everything and then I'll retire. When you retire, you may not be able to stand like that man there and preach. If you retire, you may not be able to travel in a four-wheel drive. It is now. It is now. When our knees are still strong enough. I have problems with my knees at this point. But that's not going to stop us. Maybe I need to go for a knee operation like Pastor Vincent. But I somehow think I prefer my original parts. So pray along for a, a miracle. Amen. An exceptional miracle. Is that possible with God? Praise the Lord. So you have problems, I have problems, we have challenges day and night. But you don't know, Pastor, the traffic and all that. Oh yeah, I also face the same traffic. I spend easily on the average four hours a day behind the wheel of a car. And on three times a month, I spend nine hours behind the wheel of a car because I have to travel to JB the same day and come back the same day. But I tell you what, this is a tip from me. The four hours you spend behind the wheel of the car, the nine hours if you have to spend behind the wheel of a car, you know what you can do? That will be your best quiet time. Switch off your light and easy. And go into worship. Amen. So that you can still serve God when you come for prayer meeting. How do I survive in this ministry? It's because of the four hours I spent behind the wheel of the car. Nine hours I spent behind the wheel of the car speaking to God in tongues. Otherwise, there's not much time for me to prepare. Church, I challenge you. I understand what you go through. I empathize with what you go through because I'm working as well. But that doesn't stop us from serving God. But you, you know, Pastor, I have to take leave, you know. I also have to take leave. Huh? Two years ago, I blew my entire leave huh, for two mission trips. Ten days each trip. Two trips, 20 days, gone, my mission. I owe the company four more days. But praise God, the boss was gracious enough to erase the four days utang. So that I can start a brand new year with another set of new leave. And for your information, I just blew another five days of leave this year on missions. It's not about the sacrifice. I tell you, you have not experienced until you, you serve God with a reasonable service. The five days I spent in Sarawak is equivalent to the 365 days I will spend here. The moment you get on the plane, leave all your baggages behind, switch off your handphone, you enter into the ark of God and you are in a world of your own. You and God. Amen? Like those six people that followed us. They never see the power of God to that extent. But you say, Pastor, not easy, you know. Nothing is easy. There is always a price to pay. I've been paying this price for the last 30 years. Nothing is easy. Still paying for it. But it's okay. God is no man's debtor. The satisfaction the fulfillment of seeing what God is doing in our lives and in the lives of the people, that is good enough. Amen. So tonight, while you're sitting here, my urge, I beseech you like Paul says, get hot, get on fire for God. Amen. While you may still serve the Lord in the days of your youth, get on fire for God. Not necessarily you may want to go, if you have not attended MEP, it's fine. Not necessarily you need to go to a, a foreign country. Start here. Your neighborhood, your community, your workplace, anywhere. But get on fire for God. 
We have our team for this year is called Hope. Maybe we can show you the slide on Colossians chapter 1, verse 27. He says here, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this ministry among the Gentiles, which is what? Which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you, the hope of glory. You know, I don't know what's your perception and understanding of hope. Many of us, we are hoping for this year to get a good job. A better pay rise, healing, restored relationship. We are, we are hoping for many of these things, which is not wrong, because Jesus is our blessed hope. But let me tell you in Colossians chapter 1, verse 27, these are all inward looking. By Colossians, it says that God wants to make known to all those people outside the mystery of the riches of His glory, which is Christ in us, the hope of glory. Amen. You have Christ in you. You have the Holy Spirit in you. The people outside are waiting for this mystery to be revealed, to be made known to them. You are the ones that God has a hope so that you can reveal this hope to those people who are dying outside, who are, in, who are in a hopeless situation, you are the carriers of hope, the agents of hope. It depends on how you look at this year's theme. Which hope are you looking for? Which hope are you hoping for? God has a hope for us because we carry that hope. We are the ones, church. Nobody else will be able to serve and save those who are lost outside. We have that power, the mystery of the riches of the glory of God is within us. So, I challenge you this evening that you will rise up to be those agents of hope so that we can go out and reach out to a dying world. Yes, as I said earlier, we have even problems of our own that we can't solve. It's okay. Don't worry, somehow God will make things work out for you. Amen. What you give, God will return to you. He's no man's debtor. We are those agents of hope today. If we don't go out, they have no more hope. We are the ones who are able to reveal and show and manifest the mysteries of God to a dying world that's outside. So this, you may choose this as your team for hope this year, rather than the ones that we always look for. Hope for a better job, fine. Hope for a better uh, career, it's great. Better family. I think God will add that to us. If we seek Him first and His kingdom, and then He will add all these things unto us, isn't it? So let us stand this evening. I'd like to invite the musicians to come forward. Come up. I will just end by saying this. I may not have another opportunity like this to speak, God willing, if there is a door that's open. But whatever the opportunity I have tonight, I want to make use of it 110%. And you are here tonight. You may, not be, you may not have the opportunity to hear a message like this from God. But this is where God is beseeching us, calling us tonight to be on fire for Him. And I can tell you, I can assure you, church, whatever your concerns are, Whatever your worries are, let me say this. I've got good news for you. You know, tomorrow, if you happen to read the newspaper, tomorrow is equinox day. That's the day when the sun is directly over the equator. That's the day when the sun is the hottest at its maximum. 
And that's the day when it's overhead, where there will be no shadows cast because it's right over our heads. It will be at its maximum. That's the hottest day in the year for us. And I know you can feel already the temperature that's been rising. But I say to you, the Bible uses this as an illustration. If you have not read this, in the book of James, chapter 1, verse 17, it says, Every good and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. Now, in those days, they used a sundial to determine the hour of the day. They'll put the sundial out in the open, and where the position of the sun cast on the sundial, when the shadow is cast on the ground, that will determine the time of the day. But the Bible says, in the eyes of God, the context is, every good, every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation, no shadow cast. It means no shadow cast, no nothing. God is always at His maximum. Let me tell you the good news. Tonight, every good and every perfect gift will be coming down from the Father of lights. And there will be no variation or shifting shadow because the power of God will be at its maximum. And it won't be at one day alone in a year. Yes, give God the glory. It won't be one day a year. It will be 365 days. This is the Bible's interpretation. The sun is not spelled S-U-N. The sun is spelled S-O-N. Jesus is here to give us every good and every perfect gift. And His power is always right above you. Always at His maximum. If you believe what James said in the Bible, I would like to invite you to come forward tonight. For whatever your concerns are, whatever your worries are, whatever your challenges are, let me tell you, the good and perfect gift is just waiting to fall on you. And that power that will fall on you will be always maximum. There will not be anything less than that. Amen.